Welcome, dear listeners, to this latest episode of the podcast series, The Way Out is In. I'm Joe Confino, working at the intersection of personal transformation and systems evolution. And I am Brother Fapu, a Zen Buddhist monk, a student of Zen Master Thich Han in the tradition of Plum Village. And today, brother, we are going to democratize this podcast because normally we just choose, normally on the day or the day before, what should we talk about today? But we are following another Plum Village tradition, which is the question and answer session where we get to ask our listeners what is it that's on their mind and how can we support them very directly. The way out is in. Welcome back, everyone. I am Joe Confino. And I am Brother Fab Hu. And Fapu, today we are going to do a question and answer session. And this isn't out of the blue, because actually this has been a real tradition of Plum Village. So do you want to just give us a bit of a background as to why question and answers? So in the Zen tradition, we always have an opportunity to ask our teacher or our mentor questions that has to do with our daily practice, our daily life. Sometimes we may be practicing and we meet an obstacle and we need some clarity or we just need another perspective so to help us open our minds. And in Plum Village, every retreat that we offer, our, our teacher always has a day um, called question and answers. So he allows people to come up one by one to ask a questions from the heart. So Tai always say a good question doesn't have to be long. And a good question has to do with your suffering, your practice, and your growth as a person. And we try not to be so intellectual in this because we're not debating about philosophy, but it's a question of the practice. My, my, one of my favorites that always sticks in uh, my mind was... Um, because I, what, what was sometimes the most profound questions came from the children. And, um, and I always remember one of the children asking Ty, sort of, why do monastics shave their hair? And, um, and Ty looked at him very intently and said, to save on the shampoo. <laughs> 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 so the, 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 the kid was really happy because actually that was a much more fun answer than probably the real answer. Yeah, yeah. So, brother, what I'm going to do is um, we did a call out on Instagram um, just saying, you know, what's on your mind? What would you like to ask? So I've got a list of questions here. Um, you haven't studied them. So this is going to be sort of uh, on the hoof, as they say. So I'm going to ask you a couple just to warm you up, brother, get you in the mood. So are you ready? I'm ready. Okay, here we go. First one. Dear brothers, one question is always on my mind for years. Why is it that monks don't treat their body well and eat healthily? Fried things or cheese are often served. I really don't understand it, but no one answers this question. Fried food and cheese, brother, is this true? Which monastery is this friend referring to? Because... In upper hand, that we don't have fried food. I, sometimes I crave French fries and nobody <laughs> would make French fries for the community. Uh, so I think it's, uh, it seems like it's, a, it's uh, talking about another tradition because in Plum Village, um, all of the food that we serve is vegan. So we don't have cheese. Um, fried food is a delicacy. So I, I think... Um, for though for who he's referring to, he must have been at um, a temple or a monastery, or he or she who asked this question, um, and probably saw a lot of fried food. But you know, if you really have a question, um, you have to go directly to the monastic of that community and just ask, "Hey, what's what's up with all the fried food? <laughs> um, are we?" taking good care of our body? Do we know how much um, fried food we are taking in and how that will impact our daily life? So, but for us here, we don't have enough fried food from time to time. It's good to treat yourself, not to be too rigid on um, 
our own diets. But here in Plum Village, we we do have a motto which is um, healthy organic food. Um, as not it's not always it's not always one hundred percent. Sometimes um, things are too expensive. But um, in the recent 10 years or so, we have happy farms that we've been growing a lot of our own vegetables. And when it comes to food, um, we do always have to consider we have protein for the community. We have enough um, greens and enough grains. So we do kind of have a a quick checklist, but also not to be so attached to that also is important. Like we should have the mentality to be... um, healthy and we know that whatever we intake has an effect on our body and mind but from time to time you know we do um, have to take care of our happiness which sometimes is is like a a cookie of childhood and for some it's like um, a dessert right it it is a a vegan brownie or something like that so we, we we do try not to be so rigid also in our diet so we have a middle way and also, brother, I think it is also true that there is a bit of a hierarchy in Plum Village in terms of food. Because What does that mean? Well, what that means is that New Hamlet serves, the nunnery of New Hamlet serves, I think, the best food. Then I think Lower Hamlet, the other nunnery, comes in second. And sort of trailing in slightly behind are the monks of Upper Hamlet, brother. Especially when it comes to... Um, to the evening meal, which is sometimes sort of leftovers, <laughs> which of course is wonderful because it uses all the food. But I think that um, I think the monks definitely could learn a few tricks from the sisters. Anyway, let's not get stuck <laughs> on that point. Um, Tread carefully, Joe. You are in the upper hand. <laughs> I know that's that's lunch gone for me. Um, and brother, the second one, very quick one. But uh, what is your favourite vegan meal served in Plum Village? Ooh, um, I I love. Vietnamese food. Um, we have a traditional sweet and sour soup from um, the southern province of Vietnam. So it's like it's it's a lot of greens. It's a they have pineapple in there, and, and it's also using tamarind. So like there is like sweet and sour, and that hits the spot for me. Yeah, me too. That is a good Vietnamese soup. Yeah, is, you can't beat it. Yeah. Good, thank you. So, um, last one on the sort of more light-hearted. There we go. Is do Zen monks intentionally engage in any forms of entertainment, or is life a big stage as we lay people are your entertainment? <laughs> <laughs> well, sometimes it's like watching lay people. It's like going to the zoo and watching the lay <laughs> <No>. people. <laughs> you know what? Sometimes the monastic ourselves are entertainment. <laughs> uh, I, I live in a we live in a very diverse community in Plum Village, um, many nationality, many different cultures. Um, so we get to see a lot. Um, so we do watch movies and we do watch um, documentaries. We are selective in our in our consumption. So normally, like um, we would have a monastic retreat and a treat for the community would to to do a cinema night um so it is like the lazy evening leading to the lazy day so we would choose films that are are nourishing for the community and there's there are many good films out there that is um entertaining as well as um, educational and it touches the heart and one fun fact is we love sport here. So the brothers um, and the sisters, we love to watch the World Cup when um, it comes around every four years. And our teacher, Tai, also would come and join us in the finals for a few minutes. And he would come to watch us. He would watch <laughs> the monastics to see our excitement, to see our where we're leaning towards. Because if we're to practice non-discrimination, we should be there just to support both team, but we are still human. We are still uh, practicing. We do have bias, especially if it's our own national uh, country that is in the World Cup, especially in the finals. We get very emotionally uh, involved. And we we have a very sweet brother, Brother Phap Ng, and he's a wonderful Dharma teacher, mentor for so many of us. And 
Um, he loves football, though. And whenever it comes to the World Cup, he always sits at the bell. So when the energy is too exciting, he would invite the bell for all of us to just come back to our breath. Or when it's like the penalties, he would make a joke and crack. Everybody, come back to your breathing, and you just <laughs> hear everyone laugh, and then we get intense again. So we do have these um, joyful moments in the community. And brother, let's not forget that you are a bit of a rap star in Plum Village. So I mean, music also is a, a big thing here. There, there, there's some extraordinarily accomplished classical and other musicians here, and yeah. and you know, singing is a big tradition in Plum Village and you are a rapper brother come on fess up yeah I I I do love rapping I do love to um to offer songs um we do have a tradition in Plum Village to offer music in the direction of the Dharma so a lot of um Thai's poetry has been put into music by our own monastic brothers and sisters and um, we would write raps to them or we would have artists to uh, to help us in completing the song. Great. Okay, so that's um, the fun over, brother. Are you warmed up enough? Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> so let's slowly uh, head into other waters. So here's one. Um, I'm interested in how monks and nuns keep being mindful while taking care of many children during the summer retreat. I find it difficult to do this with my four children aged between two to seven. There's always something going on, some argument, crying or need. Also, rest is rare. What do you recommend to staying mindful anyway? Thank you. Double exclamation mark. Because, because of course, brother, this is, of course, the best questions are questions that are relevant to more than just the person asking the question. And, and you know, it is very, very difficult to stay patient and centred with young children when with all the manic uh, behaviors going on, the, the busyness of food preparation and nappies if they're very young or entertainment or taking them to this, you know, it, it can fill people's lives and, and people can often sort of feel overwhelmed. So how do you work with the children in the summer retreat to, when they're manic, when they're argumentative, et cetera, et cetera, where they're throwing a tantrum and how can that be relevant to other people? I'm going to share my part and then I think I want to come back to you because you're a father too. Oh, yeah, so yeah. that's, um, <laughs> it's, it's better to ask parents that than monastic because we only have them for a month a year, which is a very different um, time. Huh? It's a very different experience. Um, but I, 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 I have been in the children program for a few years w w uh, in my younger years as a monk. I think the first thing um, we have to understand is mindfulness it doesn't particularly mean sitting still being calm being quiet um, walking slowly mindfulness is the energy of awareness is to to know what is happening inside of us and around us and how to have mindful actions to take care of the situation so when I'm, whenever I'm with the children, I have to shift gear. I have to tap into their energy and tap into uh, who they are. And that is your practice. Your mindfulness is the mindfulness of the children. So remove your expectation that they have to sit in stillness. They have to eat quietly. They have to drink tea, you know, like give them juice give them soda, um, be flexible, and then learn to, wh what I learned from them is that they're actually very mindful already, children, especially the young ones. They're, and they are so curious and that curiosity can become your own energy. It's like, oh, what is, what is that child so curious about? Tune into their their energy, tune into their eyes, what they are curious about, and then from there lead and be one with them. And I think the practice that I always come back to is just um, being present for them and then being open. Don't have expectation because the more expectation you have, then you want them to be a particular way. But of course, that doesn't mean you can't guide them. You can't offer them insight input and 
I see that whenever I'm very present for the children, then the children also becomes more attentive to you because they also learn by experience, by what they see in front of them. Sometimes your bodily action has a bigger impact than what you say. Or, uh, and, and, and then the practice always comes back to is, um, I always come back to is like, if I get upset at a child, if I am angry, is to see how do I want to share something to the child, um, but not be aggressive and not be angry and just be re and just be reminded of how you wanted to be uh, taught when you were a child, right? So sometimes um, I I know like I I remember growing up and saying. I never want to uh, yell like the way my dad yelled at me, for example. And then in that particular moment, your practice is recognizing, are you becoming the father, the mother that you didn't want to become? <laughs> so they are a mirror. They are a reflection. Um, so I see that the children are our practice. They, they, they are already quite... Um, mindful in their daily activity, remove a little bit of our expectations, our idea of, of being still. And then on the other hand is having space and time to make it really your recharge moment, right? Like let's say you are preparing um, food for your child. You know, for us, meditation is everyday life. It, it doesn't particularly means sitting on a cushion, um, closing our eyes, following our breath. But while you are um, uh, folding the clothes of your child, that can be a practice. You can do it with mindfulness. You can also come back to your body in that moment. You can rest um, while you are doing. It's, it's a very advanced practice, I have to say. And then what I, what I realize and is that having a community is so important and I wish that our culture in society can come back to community in supporting each other in, in, um, in caring for each other's children, as well as having, um, the trust be developed. And, and I, I, I see that how we are able to, um, to take care of hundreds of kids during the summer is having a team that supports each other and know how to um, tap in when we see our 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 brother or sister or colleagues or volunteers are being overwhelmed and we 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 just naturally say let me take care of this moment and and I feel today the, the individualism is so strong and and I think we also don't allow children to um, have experience with people outside of their immediate family and I, I say this of course we have to create safe environment um, a, a safe community but I see the the community aspect has has been lost a lot so I I, I think one of the magic in our retreat is that this there's that community sense and even the children, they feel safe. Great. Thank you, brother, so much for that. And, and um, you know, I recognize that when uh, my family with my two kids, we moved out of London mm. to rural Sussex. It was a real transformation in, in our lives because the children were much more part of the community, but also, as you say, they felt safe they were in the countryside. They were able to have a, to have much more freedom, but within a safe border. And I think one of the things people are always looking for is sort of space. You know, whether you're a kid or not, we everyone needs space. So I think the more we try to control our kids in or coerce them or have our secret wish for that we want them to be a lawyer or a doctor or that we live vicariously through their success, that if they learn to play the violin at three, that shows we're good people, I think um, is be very aware of our expectations. Mm -hmm. I know that um, I think one of the problems and it age has changed these days in terms of age people have kids, but mm. I had kids quite young. And I wish in a sense, life of course was the other way around that we came into life being wise and then grew less wise over mm -hmm. time. Because actually I realized looking back that 
I wasn't really very aware of myself when I had kids. And I think, you know, there's that phrase, you know, oh, kids, they really know how to press my buttons. Right. As though it's the kid's problem, whereas actually it's they're my buttons. So, so I think one of the things that's most helpful uh, when we're with our kids is to, that if they're pressing our buttons is to recognise they are our buttons and to look at what is it they're pressing and to take responsibility rather than blaming the kids. Um, and I think one thing, brother, in, in one of the, actually the climate leaders retreat over in the summer, people were, some of the participants were saying, well, actually, when I'm with my kids, I'm actually thinking of a work project I've got to do or thinking of other things I want to do. And and a lot of people made a commitment at the end to that when they with their kids to really, I know you've mentioned this already, to be present with their kids, to be fully, give them your full attention. Because if you're giving someone your full attention, you're more likely to get that back. Um, whereas actually, if you're not present and you're not really listening, then actually your kids will know that and they'll start to lose that sort of sense of respect or or that if I come to you, I'm going to be listened to. And actually, what we all crave for is to be listened to. Okay, brother. Um, next, and and we've got a couple of questions dealing with uh, death and grief. So the first question actually comes from a, a very old friend of mine who I haven't spoken to for years, but I saw she'd put this question in the chat. She said, my darling husband died last month and I'm struggling to cope with it all. And um, I think there's so much, of course, wrapped up in that. And then, And then the other question that's related said, says, I understand the nature of impermanence and feel my father in me, all I do and all of nature. Yet even before he has passed, I grieve deeply, feeling such sadness. Not sure what my question is. How does it, how does belief become faith maybe? So brother, I mean, those both those questions are someone who's lost someone and someone who fears losing someone. But But the question is in a sense the same, isn't it? Which is, that when we lose someone um, or fear losing someone close to us, we feel bereft, we feel lost. We feel that that person has gone forever and that, um, and that our lives are empty without them. Um, and of course, Thai's teachings are extremely relevant in helping people to deal with this sense of loss and, and to recognise that actually those in us or those we love are still present in us. But brother, do you want to with these two people, just help them to understand how do you cope with it all? We have to be mindful of our grief. Um, grief is an expression of also vulnerability. And what I've learned from the passing of my own teacher is that vulnerability and grief is also an expression of love. Um, we feel lost and we feel empty and we feel um, such sadness is because there was true love in that relationship. So first I want to point out that the sadness is also uh, coating the love that we have and to honor that love. And that means that that connection was very real for us. And to allow ourselves to feel sad is important. It's it's just the practice of mindfulness. Like like when whenever we encourage people to recognize the goodness inside of them, the freshness that is alive in them, it's also so important to recognize the sadness that we're feeling and honor it and not suppress it. And then to hold it um instead of with um, so with intense sorrow to to remember all of the wonderful experience that we've had with that person and that can become a process of of letting go when we lose someone um, 
it's gonna take time for us to see see them in us, even though intellectually we we have the Buddha's insight of interbeing, which is like we are their continuation because they were so connected to us that we carry their elements in us, their experience that that they've offered to the to us, our experience that we had with them, we we continue to carry that in us. Um, but sometimes it takes it, it it just takes time to to really feel and and um, see them in our daily life. But um, don't be too hard on oneself in in pushing ourselves to get over this, because I I know that's the norm mentality. It's like we have one day to mourn, and then we're done, and that is so that is so not reality. Like that that's that, that's just um, an idea that we have created. But the reality is that we we need time to heal. We need time to honor, to be mindful of the loss. And in our tradition, we we have an altar in order in order to honor that person. And for our friends who have lost someone, I would like to introduce this. It's a beautiful way of remembering them and expressing our love because grief is a way of showing that we want to express our love. And we we um, every day before sitting meditation in our meditation halls in Plum Village, a monk or a nun would light an incense and place it uh, at Tai's picture. And that is a way of just remembering. And in that moment of lighting that incense, or we can light a candle, right? We can be remembered of all of the wonderful experience that we've had. We can be grateful for um, the teachings that we've received. And then we can also see that because we are alive, they continue through us. So we embrace the three times in that very moment, the past, the present, and the moving forward, which is the future. So we would um, have this practice in order to, to see that even though they're not here, they are still a part of our life. And then you would want to select a very beautiful image of that person and um, create us a table, have their picture there. And that can be a practice that can support you in grieving. Um, so that that is something very practical that we do. And we would um, also put a flower that our beloved one really love. Like we're entering into autumn here in Plum Village and Thai love um, chrysanthemums, right? Chrysanthemums. chrysanthemums yeah. So I'm sure once um, that's available, we are going to buy a pot and put on Thai's altar as a way to express our love. So grief is love. So to see it, um, to to see the sadness as not a weakness, but an expression. And day by day, as we move forward, there's going to be moments when you're just going to remember them. And if you have um, such um, emotions that are going to manifest, be mindful of it. Let it manifest and embrace it though. And then tell yourself, because I'm alive, I will let them now see through my eyes. Let them eat through through my mouth. My taste is is their taste. And, um, you know, very recently, Sister Chang Kong just came back to Plum Village. And this is her first rains retreat after 2014, after Thai stroke. And I'm very mindful that it's much harder for Sister Chang Kong than most of us because her experience with Thai goes so deep and the profound relationship that they had um, through um, the peace activist work that they then they'd done through the war. And then she will follow Thai um, to the U.S. And then um, during the refugee crisis, um, being with Thai in Singapore, renting boats to rescue people, and then the creation of Plum Village and all of this. So 
everywhere that Sigo Jin Kang walks in Plum Village reminds her of Tai. And to ask for support when you need. And we were in a day of mindfulness in Lower Hamlet. And Sigo, Sister Jin Kang was definitely feeling a lot of emotion. And what she did was she opened herself and allowed others to help. She said, my, my brothers and sisters, and she was speaking to the monastic, she said, I miss Tai so much. Can you help me uh, embrace this moment? And it was such a tender moment. And Sister Chang Kang cried and I saw others holding her hands. And sometimes it's not to say anything and just to feel it and allow that to to be. And, and you have the process. We call that transformation. And so to honor it like that. Mm, beautifully said, brother. And, and it's, um, you know, to those, to, to the person who's asked a question about the fear of losing somebody precious, um, you know, there's something around turning that round to the preciousness of time, isn't it? Yeah. That, that actually, you know, we are all going to lose. I mean, there's the five remembrances, which is, um, which is sort of spoken of every, I think every day the monastics are asked to chant that, which is, you know, we have the nature to grow old, we have the nature to be sick, we have the nature to to die with nature to be separated from everyone and everything that's precious to us and all we can stand on is is our actions and thoughts and speech so you know if we know that time is running out um that is the time to actually recognize how precious things are and to and to make every moment count and, exactly uh, rather than fear it is it is embrace it because it comes to us all and i think this is so difficult in our western society and it's different in vietnam but in in a lot of Western societies, this idea that we're going to live forever and then suddenly death becomes this sort of shock. Whereas mm. actually, if we recognize, uh, and I love this in the teachings about this continuation, as you've talked about, that actually our life doesn't end when our life ends, that, that the people we love are still in us, that mm. their actions in their life, their kindness, what they've developed, what they've built, what they've cared about are still with us and, and to recognize that, that, that it doesn't end. And it continues, and the the reverberations of one person's life um, go forward in in so many ways, and we can see and embrace that. Yeah, this was my mantra um, after Tai's stroke, and taking care of Tai was present moment, precious moment. So, um, a couple of questions, which I think also speak to what a lot of people find difficult is the sense of, you know, we're in, in Buddhist philosophy, there's the sense of interbeing, we're in everybody, everyone is in us, that actually we shouldn't discriminate. And, and, and that can be very difficult for people because especially when it comes to difficulties or difficult relationships or uh, people who have faced difficult times is how, how do you sort of practice this idea of interbeing? We're all the same and we should love and be compassionate. And then also, how do we cope with people we find difficult? So I'm just going to read out a couple of questions that deal with that, brother, and then because I think it's an important topic. So the first one is, how can I open my heart to everyone? I observed in myself that whenever I see someone who is quite different from me, for example, maybe they have some difficulties so that they look unfriendly, angry, etc. I close my heart right away and don't want to talk to them. I think that it's just a way that I want to protect myself from what does not nourish me. But I think like that, how can I help other people who are suffering? And then um, another one, how do you not harbor any negativity towards people whose views and actions are built upon making others suffer? And there's one other brother, which I think is very relevant. Oh yes, how can I ask, how do you advise practicing forgiveness when you have been badly hurt? So I think all those all those questions, in a sense, are around the same topic as how can we be compassionate and forgiving and be open to people when actually there's also a need to protect ourselves? When I hear this question, um, I see myself in it too. Um, I think the aspiration to love all is like our ultimate aspiration. Um, but when we land to our two feet and our present moment, we can identify our limits also. 
and we should honor our capacity. So in the t- in our training as a monastic, we always say, "Be mindful of your capacity. How much can you love? How much can you handle suffering? And how much are you ready to face the difficulty?" And it's not about neglecting, but it's like identifying and then making sure that we are developing our stability to continue to generate the energy of love and compassion. So, the beauty in all of these questions was, I hear, I hear the aspiration to love. Let's let's um, focus there right right now. Is when I hear that, we we know that love. There's four elements in love. That is a loving kindness, having a kind heart, um, compassion. Compassion is a very powerful energy. But for us to have compassion, we have to have understanding. So we have to see the person suffering and have understanding. To why they behave in such a way, even though it is so, so bitter. But it, when you recognize that their their whole life they've never been loved, their whole life they may have been bullied, their whole life they have only been taught how to hate. So suddenly, when you have that understanding, your mind has a cultivation of. Oh, that's why they're like that, and you start to have some understanding. Then your heart has a nectar of compassion, and you can see that they are not just their words or their action, but they are what they have experienced. And then the other element is joy, right? If they are so um, angry and so, it's because they have no joy in their life. So you can. Be compassionate about that, and the last element of true love is um, developing our uh, inclusiveness. That's a really hard one, but um, it's we have that seed in us. And so, what I want to um, focus on and, and share towards this answer is um, sometimes we just have to accept that we don't have the ability to love that person. Yet, but we're on the path to growing our love. At the beginning, our heart may may only be able to accept so much, but the more we practice, the more understanding we have, understanding ourselves and then understanding others, our love will grow and our capacity will grow. And we call this the fruit of the practice. So we we hear the teachings of. Of um, interbeing and love, and we're like, yes, I'm gonna be exactly that energy. But then once you go out and you meet a situation, and you are exactly the opposite of what you want to be, smile to that, and then say, ah, I still have to grow in my practice. I have to grow in my understanding. And the Buddha gave this image um, uh, of this teaching of like, at the beginning, our heart um, is. May maybe just like um, a little cup of water, and if you put salt in it, you can taste the salt right away. But the more you love, your 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 love is like a great river, or ocean. No matter how much salt is put in, you will never become salty. But you're able to see and to recognize and just to embrace. And sometimes um, we have to say, see that. The person we want to help, they're not yet there, and sometimes they're not willing to be helped. Also, and so our practice is not to fix everyone, but our practice is to learn to love oneself and then love others. And maybe one day that person will real will recognize that every time they were a particular way, but our way of of still. Caring for them and embracing them will will wake them up and say, "How did you do that? Like, why were you so kind to me in every moment that I was so bitter?" And so, our action can also be a mirror to them. Um, I, I, 
my my dharma name means dharma friend and friendship is also um is talked about kindness karuna uh, and and mitra mitra is love and in friendship there has to be love and i i was very ambitious to be everyone's friend and i realized that not everybody wants to be my friend <laughs> and sometimes that is the reality and you also have to accept that and i i remember one time um in one of my relationship with a brother at the beginning it was very beautiful and then one day he just didn't like me and every time i entered into the room he would leave and we would sit in the circle he would not look at me and i was like wow what happened and honestly like i i, I did like so many meditations and I, i like i i went back a few weeks a few months a few years and i just couldn't understand what happened and till today honestly i still don't know but our relationship has has developed and um i i'm able to to say hello and we're able to have a conversation but there's still a, a part in me where i'm i'm still finding the courage to ask him hey what happened back then and maybe my only sense is that when i became um abbot i think i shifted a little bit and maybe um the what i represented and maybe it was power was something that that didn't um resonate with him and he didn't want to be associated to me and that's just life sometimes like sometimes you just have to accept it and i still the practice at that moment for me was not to hate him because he doesn't like me but is to still see him as a wonderful person there's a very wonderful sutra which was like it still is my 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 compass in relationship it is the five ways of putting an end to anger so please uh you can find this on our website you can find this um in the buddhist um sutras and it's from shariputra um, one of the buddha's uh, most senior uh, student and it's very simple but it goes like this it's something like this uh, when some if you're angry with someone and it's because his his words are not kind but his actions are still kind and in his heart there is still kindness pay more attention to his kind action and his heart because he's still unmindful of his speech and if you pay attention to his other goodness your hatred your heart won't become so bitter towards that person and you still are able to embrace and then another example is if his words uh, if his actions are not kind but then his heart is kind and his speech is kind then you pay attention to that so in the sutra it's like you 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 still see, we still know that all of us we have our goodness and our bad habits and then the last one which is like if they have no um if their hearts are not kind their actions are not kind and their speech is not kind if anything we should be more compassionate we should pity because they nobody helps them and they have no friends or all their friends are not true friends because if you behave in such way and nobody is telling you then you're very unfortunate nobody is showing you how to love and if they're lucky someone will be courageous and compassionate enough to say hey you suffer and you make a lot of people suffer are you aware of that and do you want to transform do you want to change are you lonely and maybe we can be that person to someone who is um uh, suffering immensely so have recognize your capacity of love um know that love is um is organic and it can grow it's an organ it's an energy that will will continue to grow through our own development of our understanding and um sometimes just know your limits when you're very tired your capacity of love is less so you you start in the practice of mindfulness you start to know your own habits know when to step out when to not engage um when to engage and so on and 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 not have the idea that 
um, we we have to be embracing and accepting all all at the same time. Um, our 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 love is like the northern star, and we want to walk towards there. And the more we walk towards that path, we 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 are embarking on the path of a bodhisattva to love all beings. Yeah. Brother, wow, there's that's so much in that answer, so thank you. And um, I just want to sort of go and tease out just a couple of things because um, and give it just a sl- another sort of dimension, especially to that one about capacity, because I think what often happens is that people think they should be more compassionate. And then if they find they're unable in that moment to be compassionate, they, they use that to berate themselves and beat themselves up to say, oh, I'm no good, I'm a bad person. So it's, it's that, that capacity is not is when you recognize your capacity and you said smile to it. And I, and I just wanted to highlight that point about, you know, smiling to your capacity means recognizing where you are not blaming yourself or feeling that you're a bad person because otherwise you use that actually to self-attack yourself and actually use that to beat yourself with the stick rather than the other person. And and I I was remember when I was living in the States and um and people and Donald Trump had become president and he was doing all what he was doing and people said, well, you know, you need to learn to love him and appreciate, you know, he's a narcissist and he's obviously had a terrible childhood and all that. And that was all true, but it is really, really hard Mm -hmm. when you see people who are doing such what you consider to be to do great harm in the world to really, even when you know the circumstances, to recognize that it is hard. It's not just saying, oh, yes, and it's, you know, oh, I'm going to love him and I'm Mm. going to forgive him for everything and it's all good. It's like we, we find compassionate, but we also have to recognize the harm that is being done. And that is love too. And that is love too. And and I think especially for people, if they're in danger, so if they're if they're dealing with someone which who is doing harm to them or abusing them, it's recognized there's also a limit. And you know, it's not about sometimes it's not about saying, Oh, well, I need to open up more, I need to be more compassionate. It's saying sometimes I need to get out of here. Yeah. I need to actually create a distance because actually we do also need to be safe. And we can't just love everyone regardless of what their actions are. And um, sometimes love can be very strong. We sometimes we call it fierce compassion. Um, as an abbot, um, I had to ask people to leave the monastery because they weren't um, living in harmony with the community. Their way of life, their actions, their speech was very negative. It was um, bringing the energy of the community down. Um, it was very disruptive. They didn't want to practice the Dhamma that we were offering. Um, they they didn't want to follow. They wanted to be their own teacher. And they and then we, we in one retreat we had um, someone like was telling was telling the retreatants, "Don't listen to the monks and nuns. I I have practiced longer. I have more insight. I'm older than most of them that are teaching now." And so many people were confused. And then so many people were. Um, also complaining to us about their experience of the retreat. And and we came and we had to talk to this person. And at the end of it, you know, this person was searching for love, searching for validation. But the, the harm that that person has done, the energy that that person has offered wasn't supportive. And we did have to ask that person to leave. And so sometimes we, we have to see also the bigger picture um, um, and that is also protecting right protection is also love and we one time had to also ask a monastic to leave the community because they they can't grow and they're not um, they are not willing to be trained anymore um, everything that um, they were going through uh, their words their um, their their daily um, bodily action wasn't according to our training, wasn't according to our precepts, our, our mindful manners. And it was very disruptive and it was bringing s- the energy of the community so down and so many people were giving energy. And and we kind of created a time frame. like if you don't transform within, if you don't even show us in six months that you you want to change and you you're opening yourself up to the community again, 
you know, we ask that we we ask that person to leave because we we also have to know our capacity because if we're just tunneling all of our energy to one person 365 um, days then we don't have time for our other brothers and sisters so as as we grow and in 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 father mother leaders elder brother and sisters you know I, I had to learn this a lot like how much love do I have to offer to one person but if that person is not willing to change I also have to accept my limitation and some, sometimes I felt like a failure. I felt like I couldn't help that person. And I went through all the emotions. I'm like, ooh, well, maybe my virtue is not good enough that, I, that they can't see my words as a guiding, um, an energy for them to change. But sometimes that's just what it is maybe. And, and, and just learn from this experience. And then I, I've also re- recognized that um, sometimes if there's a, if there's a rotten grape, you know, and it's touching the other grape, and if you let it continue, the other grape will also be rotten. And so the love is to identify um, the sickness and you have to remove it. And sometimes it's very painful, but it's the right action for the body. Yeah, so, so compassion can be a sword. Exactly. And, and also what I've tended to notice is if people are acting in that way often they are suffering in that situation and actually by releasing them in whatever way that can actually benefit them it's not that that the compassion is is more than just trying to help that person in that moment if that person is deeply unhappy in the place they're in and they're not willing to change they're going to continue to be really unhappy apart from infecting the people around them it's not actually healthy for them either okay brother um you mentioned about the sutra on anger Mm. So I just want to come back to that topic because that is something, it's an issue I've had in my life, short mm-hmm. temper. Mm-hmm. It's an issue many people have, which is around um, what is anger? Does anger have a purpose? You know, and, and there's a question that particularly asks that. So I just wanted to focus on that. So I'm just going to ask the question. A friend asked me about the place of anger in the world. He says anger has an important role in progressing social issues and I struggle to explain how anger is not the key. How would you respond? And that, that's such an important question because, because sometimes it's only when we see something is wrong and that, that our energy comes up and that we, we're prepared to face it and, and then summon up the courage. And, and, and anger is an energy that does can sometimes provide that sort of sense of righteousness and um, I'm not going to stand for this anymore, I'm going to take action. And, and we've seen that, you know, in the climate movement, for instance, people taking direct action. Um, but also there's a problem with anger, isn't there, brother, that, that anger tends to also generate anger, that if you're angry towards someone, that they're more likely to then raise their anger back to you. So actually anger can look, on the surface as though it's it's getting the energy going and giving you the sort of strength to act but often it builds more anger and actually we end up in a worse place so so is there a place for anger or what if there isn't what is another energy that could provide the same sort of in a sense support for action but actually maybe is more generative or regenerative rather than creating more problems Anger is an energy and it's an emotion that we all um, have. And sometimes I can see anger as a bell of mindfulness. It's like, oh, why do I feel so angry? It can help me reflect things. But our training, because we we know that anger is an energy and 90% of the time is very, dis- is very destructive. Anger makes us say things that are very unkind. Anger makes us behave in such a way that that offers more hate. So our training is when you're angry to embrace the anger, recognize the anger, and take care of the anger and transfer that energy of anger into another energy to take care of the situation. Because most of the time anger, when you're when you're angry, you're not very clear. Because that anger becomes a layer of that that makes um, your judgment mm, more angry, your speech more angry, your actions more angry, and like you said, anger also generates more anger. 
So anger, I would say we can recognize it and see it as a bell of mindfulness and reflect why am I angry? And then from the, from the why am I angry, we identify. And it can be because an injustice has happened. And to now um, use our energy of mindfulness to identify the unjust and call the unjust by its name without the energy um, of hatred, but the energy of, of compassion and love of wanting to, to help this situation. So compassion is another energy. Our teacher usually encourage us to take care of situation with compassion. But with that example that we just shared about love, compassion doesn't mean soft and embracing and, ex and accepting all, but compassion has clarity in it because there's understanding. And sometimes you need to take actions that um, um, put someone in prison because that's the right thing to do, but that is out of compassion. And most of the times when we're angry, we just want to punish. Anger has a strong energy of wanting to punish. And so seeing that anger, um, it also drains us. If, if, if you've experienced that, like when I act on my anger, it drains me more than, than giving me energy where people f have also shared that anger can be a, um, that gives you energy, but take that anger and transform it to another energy such as, um, compassion or such as, um, just the energy of goodness. I, I want to do something that is, is um, that helps prevent the suffering and, and, and now have the lens of the Four Noble Truth that suffering is present. I want to recognize the suffering, see the root of the suffering and then transform the suffering. And, and that, that clarity can offer kindness. So anger is an emotion that in Buddhism, we, we see it we see it as a hindrance to our liberation because we're not saying that it's, it's just negative, but because that energy provides more wrong action than right action. And so just to share with their friends, I see you're angry. Let's, let's look at that anger. And can we, can we identify why we're angry? And then can we work on that situation rather than work on that anger because we're angry of something and, and sometimes we're angry we don't even know why we're angry and so mindfulness is to become aware of the source of our anger and then to work at the source so so we know brother that um the best advice that Ty gave about anger is don't act on it. Exactly. It's the, it's the classic thing that um, you, someone says something, you get an email blaming you for something, and, and you immediately write that email back saying da 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 da. And the advice is always don't send that email straight away. <laughs> Sleep on it. Look in the morning. And whenever I've done that, I've looked in the morning and thought, oh my God, I'm not sending that because it's, because it's, just, it's just creating a fight. And it's like when you hit people, head on people are gonna it's, it's like two rams jutting against each other they're just going to keep on fighting and um and I, I think that if we sit back and be mindful and as you say be aware of where the anger is coming from what it represents and be mindful and take time then actually as you say we get the clarity because because Anger is like a fog, isn't it? It's like you just lash out because you're trying to protect yourself. But actually, it is not an effective strategy for getting even what you want. And um, and I know that Ty has, you know, talked a lot about um, don't be an angry activist. Hmm. Because, because actually, that's just going to generate more of the same. It's not going to solve the problem. But actually what the anger, as you say, is if you recognize the injustice in a situation, is just recognize the injustice and see how can you act? How can you come alongside people and support them in moving direction? Because you're never going to do it in a fight. Yeah. So, brother, um, 
Let's have a look at something else. Yes, brother, this is this is one that I think also touches so many people's lives and it's around sort of consumption and our Western lifestyle. So, so let me just read it out. I'd appreciate an insight into how one can shift from a traditional modern Western lifestyle to a more simple and less reliant lifestyle. It feels impossible at times, as if the mindset I've been raised with, monetary gain and status are the priority, will forever be a part of me. And I think that that reaches so many people now who have been brought up with us in an in a individualistic Western life that we need to amass things that our status and um, who we are is determined by what we own or what we look like, that people feel they need to keep buying things in order to um, hide their pain and suffering, that we actually, Western society is built on avoiding suffering and think, thinking we need to be perfect and therefore the best way to do that is buy, 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 whether mm-hmm. it's cosmetics or what, whatever, the best car, a bigger house, all this stuff. It, it's so ingrained in Western society because, because from when we're born, we're tre- taught that is success. That is what we're aiming for. So, and yet we also know deep down that our happiness isn't there, mm-hmm. that actually it's in the simple things that we find our true happiness in. Time, friendship, taking, um, walking in nature, that it's not actually in products. But brother, what's, it, what's your, in a sense, your insight about because what she's this person is also an insight into how we can shift. What mm. would be an insight, and in how do we make that move from from more to Ty's perfect description of you have more than enough? And and again, you know, I mentioned this previously, but we're sitting in Tignatan's sitting still hut, his modest hut, and looking through the window, I can see his coat uh, still hanging on the on the hook, and and he was always one for he never wanted to replace a coat he never wanted to replace his robe he lived in a sense the ultimate in simplicity i think we can change the narrative of what happiness is that's the start it's because we have a view and in the teachings of buddhism we learn to reflect on the views we have and we it has to always be of something so this is like the view of happiness or the view of um, having enough. And um, we, I, I grew up in Canada and I was, I had that mentality. Uh, I, I, I remember in school, I was like, oh, I want a job just to make a lot of money so I can have, have and have. And because that was what was taught to me that that is your freedom. That is your um, success. And then when we become a monastic, um, there's a precept when you become a novice on jewelry and, and cosmetics. So we are not allowed to wear cosmetic and not allowed to wear jewelry. And the reason is because true beauty is not found in that. True beauty is found in stability and freshness and freedom. And we, we were taught this trainings. And so our teacher like broke it down. And what really stuck out to me in um, my mentors, um, sharing was, you know, uh, cosmetics are, are just an out of form. It's just a mask. And we know that everything is impermanent. So our, our face will have to change. Our skin tones will change. Our um, bodily um, form will also change. But what we can always keep alive is the love that we have, the freshness that we generate, the stability that uh, we can offer to ourselves and to the ones that we love, as well as our calmness and stillness. And that is a beauty that you cannot buy. That's a beauty that you can only practice to generate. And that really stayed with me because that is what I felt um, when I saw Thai in the, the monastics and what drew, um, drew me into becoming a, a monk was this stability and this freedom. 
And like you shared, like, I think Kai is a very beautiful person. Um, the brown robe and um, um, the brown OI jacket is very simple. There's no brand, but it's not the jacket that, that creates it, but it's, it's, it's his inner, um, his inner work, his inner transformation that has offered this, this sense of, um, of present, which is beautiful. And, and when he walks, you know, he's not in a hurry. His face is very relaxed. When he looks at you, he looks at you with kindness. And sometimes he looks with you with, with wisdom or he looks at you like he's like seeing through your soul. (laughs) And, and that, that is all like something that you have to uh, develop in our practice of understanding and right view. And if we um, practically, you know, that, that, that's like the teaching aspect and practically, you know, Tai wrote this calligraphy is you have enough. That, that, that mantra right there can be a support for all of us who is going on a shopping spree. Um, and then moderation of, of what we're seeing. We know advertisement is, is done very well to uh, attract us. And we know that that is desire. And a lot of desire is a bait. There's always a hook. So if you can see beyond the bait, like what's the hook? Right. If you want more, that means you have to work more. You sacrifice more time and energy, um, and, and you fear losing it. <laughs> and, you, and you fear losing it. And then once you, then you're chasing after it. And after you get that, the next year, the new um, iPhone comes out. When is enough? And if we actually want to um, help shift the narrative we can start to be that change. Don't wait for others. Um, and and because we are so collective, like we call this the collective consciousness. So if others are wanting, we will want to. So be mindful of that. And and, and try to practice in a way to not judge others, and, but to bring it back to oneself. Are you sure? Do I need this? If I have this, will it really make me happy? You know, these are very simple questions, but they can be koans, like mantras for us to reflect on. And um, be mindful of how much advertisement you're watching because it's really good. And, you know, I, I, I'm, this is a big practice for me too. And, it, and it, one of the wonderful things about being somewhere like Plum Village and in this area of France is that you don't see adverts and you're in mm. nature. And so you don't actually want to buy anything. And the city's far. <laughs> and, the city's far. And, and I know that as soon as I go into a city, you know, it's like, it's hard. It's because overwhelming. Because actually we're, we're surrounded. But but it's interesting because uh, the person who asked this question said, you know, how do, how do I change? But this person is already aware of the wish to change. Mm. And I think so many people in the world don't even recognize they are caught up in this web. So the, the very fact of awareness is um, the start of change. And we can practice to learn to give. Um, when you learn to offer, like give uh, things to charity, that also offers us a lot of happiness. And we see that possession is actually not, not it doesn't equal happiness, but even giving can, can generate a lot of happiness in us. Yeah. And, and, and also I find impermanence helps as well, brother. So uh, sometimes if I, I'll, I'll see something and because so much of our mind is grabbing, so I'll see something and I want to grab it and rather than buy it straight away, I will note it. And then the next day, have I remembered it? Mm. Do I still really want something? And, and, 95% of the time I kind of remember mm. what it was. And so, so, so I think there's that sense also of, of standing back from things and recognizing that our mind does grab. Yeah. And actually just what we're saying a lot actually in this podcast is stop, slow and down, reflect. be mindful, step back. Yeah. And because so often we're acting in that moment and in that moment it's not the present moment actually. Mm. Is that coming from a, diff- a different place? And we can even go deeper is um, seeing where is this energy of craving come from. And because if we want, it means there's a source. And sometimes 
it is ancestral. Sometimes this energy of not having enough comes from the suffering of our parents and our ancestors, and it has been passed down to us. And so, now that we may have much more condition than our parents, much more conditions than our ancestors, and and you still ask yourself, I do have one TV. I do have a laptop. I do have food to eat. I have a chair. I have many rooms, <laughs> not just one room. I have a living room. I have a computer room, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then you can just ask yourself, where is this energy coming from? And you can smile. Ah, this is the the seed of poverty that my ancestors went through. And just saying, ah, let me transform that in my lifetime. Mm. Thank you, brother. Just to finish off, there, there's also some very like some questions about the practice, about how people can practice um, more intentionally and, and more creatively. So, so let me ask you a couple of questions from here. The first one says, if one has to just focus on their breath while meditating and try to be here in the here and now at all times, when can they reflect on their suffering? It's such a classic one, isn't it? It's sort of like, if you're supposed to be here in the present moment, how can you deal with your suffering? Wait, who, 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 who is actually able to always focus on the breath for a good 30 <laughs> to 45 minutes? Because I, I want to know that person. Yeah, bring him in, bring him in. Um, so we, we have to understand that um, mindful breathing is an anchor that helps us... Um, return to the body, return to the present moment. Because most of the time, we're not living in the present moment. And we are living in our thoughts, we're living in our perceptions, we're living in our stories, we are living in our worries, etc., etc. So in the moment of meditation, it's actually giving us a chance to stop, feel our body, feel what is happening. Maybe we can even say, feel the, 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 the emotions from all of our thinking, some, all of our um, um, procrastination. And it's a different than looking deeply, right? So we always want to arrive on the cushion, arrive on our chair, arrive in a posture where we went, want to enter into stillness, meditation. The first um, establishment of mindfulness is the body. Just learning to be one with the body. It sounds simpler than done. You may sit on a cushion, but you're very tense. Do you recognize, is, is your back upright? Is your spine aligned with your neck and head? Is your face relaxed? Can you offer yourself a smile? Is your eyebrows and your, your forehead um, frowning because of your, your um, thinking? Are your shoulders relaxed? So the first practice that we all um, are taught when you sit on the cushion is to feel the body. And then from there, you start to, it's like a fan. You're like a fan that is running 24 hours. And suddenly in this moment, you want to slow the fan down. For some experienced practitioner, one breath allows them to be in the present moment. But for some of us, we need these steps, like the body, after relaxing, noticing tension, and then coming to the breath. So the breath is um, it's not just in and out because the breath is life. And by mindful breathing, our in-breath and out-breath can, can accompany our deep looking. So in the exercises of mindful breathings, there's 16 of them, um, it asks us to also look at impermanence. So... Is the breath and the thought, are they two separate things? Or actually the breath can accompany the deep looking. And we will have the tendency to deep look, to reflect, but then our thinking will overtake us. It's very natural. It's a natural pattern. It's our habit. And so when you find yourself overthinking and, over, and lost in your thought, you come back to your breathing so that you don't lose yourself in the mind of 
the stories that you are creating. But yes, in the meditation, sometimes you can bring up a subject to look at. But then you can also be lost in looking at that subject. So your mindful breathing guides you back. My own experience um, is that now I'm more busier than some brothers and sisters in the community. And most of the time, I am looking deeply <laughs> at the planning, at um, difficulties that are manifesting in the community. Um, I... I I use my my time to sit, to talk, to reflect on how to resolve the situation or what's the best way to plan for the next year, et cetera, et cetera. So I find that this sitting meditation is the moment to just let my mind have a break. Because we know that when the body can rest, we can do more. So if you can let allow your mind to rest, you can also be more productive in your deep looking. And um, we know that even with this questions, we're trying to attain something. Sitting meditation sometimes can be as simple as just sit and enjoy sitting. Because in our society, we're doing more than being still and to look deeply. So we looking deeply is an art and we don't want to also be lost in the looking deeply. And most of the time we're, we're already living outside of our body because we're thinking and we're procrastinating, we're um, anxious, all these emotion, all this energy, we're judging. So to come back to the present moment with the breath and just to feel the breath and to allow yourself to be neutral, not have even um, um, have feeling happy or feeling um, sad. Sometimes we can be attached also to our happiness, our joy, our excitement, right? So even to the peace, like I want to be like how I was 10, 10 days ago, but the practice of, of sitting meditation is accepting ourselves in the here and now. Oh, beautifully spoken, brother. Thank you. So I'm going to ask you one final question because, um, because I've, I've, um, I've uh, put you through the mangle. I mean, it's, it's quite hard, this, actually. I mean, you're used to it, but normally we to pick one subject and go deep in it. This is like we're, we're jumping around. And, of course, it's all connected, but um, I recognize that it's, it's a, a lot to go through. So one final question. I teach architectural design to high school students. Do you have any suggestions on how to weave mindfulness principles into a classroom environment? Mm. Which is a great question because, of course, Ty did a lot of, and the community have done a lot of work with teachers and with um, bringing sort of mindfulness practices into school. So what would be your recommendation on how to weave? So what, what is the sort of way that people could introduce this into the classroom in a way that doesn't um, create uh people either to think, oh, I'm not doing that, or to think, oh, this is religion. How, how, what is a skillful way to bring this into a teaching environment? Well, first of all, thank you for being a teacher. Um, we know uh, that a happy teacher can change the world. And that is a very beautiful insight that Tai had because um, a lot, a lot of um, people we may encounter may come from um, broken families or a situation where there's not enough love. So a teacher can be a second chance to offer love, to offer care, offer attention. Um, the practice, first of all, has to be done with the individual. If we want to offer something, we also have to cultivate it for ourselves. Um, be skillful, be attentive to um, how much emphasis we want to put into the class and not to come out as um, um, preaching. Preaching, exactly. Nobody likes a preacher, uh, but we like to see examples. I always say, if you're a happy teacher, they will see your stability, your presence, and they will say, huh, it's more, I'm learning more 
than just the technique that he's teaching me. I'm learning how he's presenting. I'm learning how the teacher is showing up. Sometimes teaching is just showing up. How do you show up? Um, so that's that's like the inner development that I want. I wanted to make sure um, um, I talk about because I'm now a teacher too. So I know if I if I don't develop these um, these practices in myself, then I won't have anything to offer. So another another way of looking at it is what I want to offer. I need to learn how can I offer it to myself so that I can offer it to others. So I, be, by becoming a, a teacher, I've learned to become a better student. I study it more. Um, practically, I, I I have friends that are teacher, and they have used some of the um, experience that they had at the retreat, and they brought it into their classroom, and it has really worked. So I was a guest speaker for um, the art. Um, what was it? It was a it was a university in San Francisco, and I was a guest speaker. And the way that he changed his his um his space how he start his class was before they start um he took in this um this element from the walking meditation you know before everybody um is a before we start the walk everybody is gathering so in Plum Village we would sing mindful songs we would sing songs and sometimes you know the awkward silence make people very uncomfortable so mindful singing was a way to allow people to ease into this collectiveness. So what he did was uh, each each uh, class, because um, it was only once a week, he would ask one student to select a playlist and to play that, that playlist as students are arriving. And then they would all, when they all arrived, they would stand in a circle and he would um, guide them through three deep in-breath and out-breath. And then slowly he would introduce, yes, I did learn this from a meditation center because if we want to learn, we have to be present. And what, why not say that, right? That allows people to enter into a space of presence. And then he would ask that student to share with us just in a few lines why, what, um, what this playlist meant for them. Why were these songs important to them? And that allows them to share about their, what they're going through. So it's a skillfulness that you can, can, can add into the classroom. And then because his, his class was, I think, an hour and a half. So like every uh, 45 minutes, they would take uh, a break and they would all stand up from sitting. They would all stand up and come back um, to the breath, feel the body, and then go again. And that, he said, that really shifted the energy of the class. And everybody like waited for that moment to just all stand up together. It wasn't awkward. It wasn't um, um, religious at all. It was just a moment to rest and to feel where we're at. And, and then sometimes you can ask, you can curate some questions to, to talk, to ask something different than the classroom than what's being presented in the classroom. So I think that that was something I experienced that was very unique when I was a guest speaker. So I joined in, well, they had a monk, so I led some of it. <laughs> and and it was um, it was very unique. And many, I saw, it, it's like the mindfulness bell that we have in our app. Every 45 minute or 30 minute, that bell can ring. And then it just tells us to stop and come back to ourselves not lose ourselves and then continue. And we see that the learning, we we need energy, we need to be present to learn. So I think that is something that we can skillfully um, introduce to the class. Um, some other teachers are, are even more brave. Now um, Buddhism is becoming more popular, or mindfulness is, is becoming more popular. So they're, they're, they even introduced the bell to the classroom. So every uh, 30 minutes, they would invite us on the bell and everybody would just come back to the breath and then continue on. And that allows the teacher to also have a, a moment to just take care of themselves. And then I think on the personal side, it's just um, as a teacher, you're offering more than just the knowledge, but you can also offer the care of seeing someone, if a student, if if they're going through something um, difficult, instead of being angry and wanting to scold, ask them, 
how are you, how are you doing? How's your heart? Um, um, is there any way that I can support you? you? You know, and I think these questions to students are very valuable. It, 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 it shows that we are here for you. I, I want to support you. I want to not just teach you um, philosophy or ideas, but I want to show up. And when you show up like this, they're being taught of how, how to love. Beautiful, brother. Thank you. So, brother, I feel I've I've um, I feel this has been like a dharmic quiz show. Yeah. Because I because it'd be like rapid fire. Because normally um, in Plum Village, um, in between each question, there is an invitation for the bell and to breathe every time. And 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 so uh, in a sense, you've <laughs> I, it's been very quick fire because because we haven't had that. And uh, so. Thank you, particularly for this episode, actually, because for, for going across such a range of topics and, and speaking about each one so beautifully. And this is fun. I think we should do this more. Yeah, well, I, well I, think we, I think we will. I mean, we've gone through quite a lot of the questions, actually, but I'm sure there'll be many more in the future. Um, so, brother, um, I know we normally finish with just slowing it all back down and mm. coming back um, to our centre, being present in this moment, and for you to offer us a short meditation to help us just uh, let go of all the words, hold on to the meaning that's uh, that's infused in us, and then just to uh, be here right now. Thank you. Hello, friends. Uh, I invite you to stop whatever you may be doing, unless you're driving, please continue to drive. Um, you may be walking, going for a jog, cleaning your house, or just sitting on the bus at a commute or in the train. Just allow yourself to be still, um, feel your two feet on the ground, feel your buttocks on the chair or on a cushion. Or if you're laying down, you can just feel your whole body touching the earth. And just give yourself uh, some moments to just sink into the body, feel the weight of the body. If there's any tension on your face, on your forehead, just offer a smile. If there's tension in the shoulders, in the arms, in the back, just release it. Let Mother Earth embrace the tension. This is also self-love. And so now I would like to invite you to be attentive to your in-breath. As I breathe in, I know this is an in-breath. As I breathe out, I know this is an out-breath. Just feel the in-breath coming through our nostril. Feel the out-breath coming out of our nostril. In, out. As I breathe in, my breath becomes deeper. As I breathe out, my breath is slower, more gentle. I allow myself to have a deep in-breath. And I allow myself to have a calm and gentle out-breath. It is deep. It is slow. And 
Breathing in, I'm in touch with the stillness in me. Breathing out, I enjoy the stillness. Breathing in, I allow this air to freshen my day. Breathing out, I smile to life inside of me and around me. In, fresh, out, smile. Breathing in, I'm grateful to this in-breath. Thank you to the in-breath for life. Breathing out, I am grateful to the out-breath. In, grateful to the breathing. Out, grateful to the out-breath. Thank you, dear friends, for practicing and for being a part of our journey. Yeah, thank you, Fapu. That was a really wonderful uh, meditation. Um, so, dear listeners, oh, I feel all calm now. <laughs> My whole voice has sort of gone quieter. So, dear listeners, if you have enjoyed this episode, um, you can hear many others. We are on Spotify, on Apple Podcasts, on other platforms that carry podcasts, and on our own special Plum Village app. Um, particular thanks to our friend and long-term lay practitioner Martin who is uh, here today at short notice to record it without Martin there would be no podcast today so thank you um, and also to uh, co-producers of Global Optimism. This podcast was brought to you by the generous donors of the Thich Nhat Hanh Foundation. If you would like to support future episodes of the podcast and the work of the international Plum Village community, please visit www.tnhf.org/donate. The way out is in. Oh.